everyone. Hey, thanks so much for joining me today. I hope you are doing well. Let me ask you, what motivates you? What motivates you in your relationships or in your marriage if you happen to be married? Or what motivates you at work or to work? Well, you say it's fear, really. You know, if I don't work, then I get fired and then I can't make my house payment. And uh, yeah, that can, can be a motivator. Or maybe some of you say it's guilt. You know, I have to do it. I don't really want to, but I got to do it. You know, God's got something much bigger and better for us. The very core, the very reason, the very purpose for doing what we do. And it's good news for everyone. I'm really looking forward to sharing this message with you that I called Compelled. You know, what gets you up in the morning? What gets you excited? What is it that really gets you stirred and motivated? And some of you, when I say that, some of you might uh, maybe think of like a hobby, something that, you know, you like to do that's a little diversion from, from the normal. But... Um, but, you know, when we use that terminology, what gets you up in the morning? What gets you excited? Uh, many times, you know, when people talk about their, their work, you know, that's, that's my dream for every person to have a job where you're excited to get up in the morning, where you don't have that wrestling match or that tug of war with a snooze button, you know? And so, uh, anyway, there are some really creative ways of getting people out of bed today, these, these days, you know? Um, the one I like, I don't have one, but I think it's really kind of a cool idea. It's, it's a lamp that slowly gets lighter and lighter and lighter. And, and, and you know, it's, just, it's not just like, wow, there it is. So um, not telling on anybody specific, but I know about this particular mother I heard of one time who used to do this to her kids. She would go bursting into the room, open up the shade, and she'd say, rise and shine, you know, and... Um, that particular mother was a morning person, although I think she was a night person too. I think she's like a 24-7. Um, but, um, but yeah, that's the way, you know. Then when we became believers, it was like it, she would walk in, you know, and, I, and we had blackout blinds. Remember the blackout blinds used to have? I mean, pitch dark and all of a sudden, this is the day the Lord has made. We will be rejoiced and be glad. And then it was like, are you kidding me? I didn't even, most mornings, I, in fact, still, I don't even know if I'm a Christian until, you know, like 10 a.m., you know. So, I mean, I, I, there's some doubt there. But it's kind of rough, but, but what is it that gets you excited? You know, what is it? You know, we say, okay, morning people, night people, but what, what kind of a people are you? What gets you really going and gets you really thrilled? When I was a sophomore in high school um, a few years ago, <clears throat> yeah, okay, thank you. But when I was a sophomore year in high school, we did, we did this um, survey. It was kind of a, a professional assessment. And what that we did was we took this test and it wasn't done by Christians. It was just, it was a, you know, a secular uh, assessment kind of thing. It was great to find out what career we would be good at. And when the results of that evaluation came back, I was gravely disappointed because it said I should go into social work. Now that upset me for two reasons. One, there's no money in social work. <laughs> and secondly, it was always my dream to become a lawyer. And so, um, now, one of the reasons why we did this assessment was really in preparation for an assignment. We were going to be doing a paper as well as a, um, as a presentation. So we would do a paper and also do a presentation, kind of telling uh, the class, our particular class, about that particular career. Now, we didn't have to choose one that we were necessarily wanting to pursue. It may be something we're just interested in or whatever. So, um, and that was, that was the case. And so we had a day when it was first come first serve and um, our class had about 25 in it we have a, a school of it was well back then it was about 250 or so Berean christian high school is now uh, over 400 but um so our classes were, were small relatively small so but on the day we were to pick the career we wanted to do i was away at a speech meet and so i didn't get to pick my career choice until the next day and when i got back they said oh lawyers already been taken and I knew, I knew the few of us that had talked about doing that. And so, um, so I was really bummed. I thought, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Well, I, I mentioned I went to a Christian school. So the teacher pulled me aside privately and she says, you know, David, she goes, nobody's doing anything on ministry. And she goes, why don't you do a paper on ministry? So that was the beginning. I consented and that was the beginning of the end <laughs> of what I thought was going to be my career and what was the start of God tugging on, the, on my heart, tugging in my life um, to go into ministry. Um, on occasion, uh, at, at my Christian school, I had opportunities to speak. And I mentioned I was at a speech meet and I did enjoy doing that. And I was in drama some. And, uh, and sometimes because uh, every, I think it was every uh, twice a year, we did what they called a student chapel. 
And so the students would be in charge of the whole chapel, the speaking, the music, and all of that. And oftentimes, I was asked to be the speaker for the chapel. And so people would say things to me like, oh, David, you should be a pastor. You should be a pastor. And I, it really, really irritated me. It really bothered me. And um, I really, I, I didn't like it. Well, 45 years later, I, they, they might have been right, I'm thinking. I don't know. I'm, I'm still trying to figure that out. They might have been right. I wasn't a great student. And some of you are going to say, man, he's really dissing on himself. I'm just, I'm being really honest with you. I was not a great student. Actually, I should say I wasn't, I'm not a, um, I'm not a smart student. I worked really, really, really hard. I was a very hardworking student. Um, it's kind of like, I'm kind of one of those people when I don't have in skill, I try to make up in enthusiasm. Um, so, uh, I, I worked really, really hard and school was very difficult for me. Uh, college was grad school was, you know, all of that to this day, it takes me, I feel like a long time to learn things. I don't think I'm particularly, uh, uh that I have a good memory. Some of you say, I can't memorize Bible verses. I have a terrible memory. I feel like I have a terrible memory. Um, I read slow. Um, and that's at 60 years old. I still, I read slower than I'd like to, but, um, what I did know was how to work really hard. And so basically what I was, was a C student who worked really, really hard and got A's and B's. Um, now I didn't tell anybody else that I was struggling and had a hard time. Uh, but I just, you know, Hey, I was going to try and be up there at the top and fool them all. And my parents can tell you of the, uh, you know, all nighters that I would do studying for a test that should have taken me a few hours would take me, you know, nine. And, uh, but I thought I'm going to, I'm going to try really hard. Well, fast forward to 1989, none of you were born yet. So that, you know, just relax, but, um, 1989, when I came here, I came here in 1989. I came here in September of 1989. Was married in October of 1989, um, and I knew, I knew to work hard, but I didn't really work smart. And what I mean by that is, I tried to do everything. So I literally taught a uh, when I would come in on Sunday morning, Sunday morning, Sunday school. It was it was a, a combined teach, um, teenager and adult Sunday school. I taught uh, Sunday school, you know, Sunday morning, led the singing, did the preaching, uh, come back on Sunday night, Sunday night. Did the same thing, led the music, Sunday night service. And those were two separate things. My wife still looks back and she goes, how did you do that? You, you prepared a message for Sunday morning. You prepared a message for Sunday night. And then on Wednesday night, we'd have prayer meeting. And we would come in and we would have a, a little message. It would be kind of like a mini, mini message. And then we would break up and have prayer and all of that. Well, besides that, I also led the youth group. And I directed the VBS and the children. And I, you know, I just did all this and... Just to round things out, I usually mowed the lawn as well. So, I mean, I was doing all of this. I had a lot more youth than smarts, all right? Some of you have had stages of your life, right? Where you can say, yep, I, I can identify that. But I worked really, really hard. But when I came to Hillside, I was committed to growing the church any way we could. I remember uh, we didn't have any babies here at the church. Um, in fact, the nursery, Cindy and I, I wish I had pictures of it, but Cindy and I, she was pregnant with jo Janelle, my oldest daughter. We were painting the church, uh, the, the, uh, the nursery, you know, and uh, there we were. And so when we announced to the church that she was pregnant, I said, I am committed to growing this church any way possible. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so, uh, so the rest of you young people get to it. Right? So anyway, but um, anyway, but, uh, and that is a true story. I did say that, but uh, anyway, not many years into my ministry, I would plan, you know, to try and uh, do whatever we could to, to, you know, get people here. And, um, and one of the things that I did that I, I want to say I regret, but I, I would not have done if I had it to do over again. And that was, I didn't care how, to, how I grew the church, how the church grew. And I say I grew the church because that's kind of how it felt. I wasn't really leaning on God as much as I was just, thought, I'm going to work, work, work like crazy. And I didn't really care if, um, if people came from other churches. You know, if they said, you know, oh, I don't. Now, if it was, let me just say a little caveat. If it was a cult or something, okay, I didn't mind that. But if it was a good Bible-believing, teaching church, you know, and they came, um, I really, it didn't really bother me that much. But not many years into ministry, I planned this activity. It was an outreach event and so forth. And I thought, okay, we're going to reach people. We're going to get people to come in. And my wife, who was not raised in church, um, became a Christian, I think, as a senior in high school um, at a Christian camp that some friends invited her to, she, uh, she said to me, she goes, you know, David, <laughs> unbelieving people won't want to come to that. And she didn't say it to be mean. She was just helping me out because, you know, from the time I was 10, I was in church. So I thought, you know, hey, this is, everybody's going to love doing this. 
And she said, yeah, you know, unbelievers, non-Christians, they, they, would, they would never want to come to that. And she was right. And again, she wasn't being mean. It's just that she was raised with a, with a perspective that, hey, this is what unbelievers will show up to. It was then that I realized over a period of time after that, where I really looked inward and I realized, you know, Jesus called his disciples to be fishers of men, not keepers of an aquarium. <laughs> Outreach should not be me sneaking over to another church, in analogy, getting my net, scooping them out and bringing them over here. See, that was, that was not outreach. That was not discipleship. That isn't what Jesus had in mind at all. And so that really helped me when she really helped me along with, hey, what would believers want to come to? And, um, and she shared things with me. She said, hey, they're struggling with their family. They're struggling with their marriage. Um, you know, help have a parenting class. Have a, and that's when I really started focusing more on, you know, helping with counseling and helping with doing some children's things or whatever. But as I looked at the life of Jesus, I never saw him trying to convince the already convinced or, you know, reach the already reached. He also didn't try to reach those people who didn't want to be reached. He didn't try to reach the people who thought, I got this together. I'm fine. God, I'm fine. I don't need you. I don't need a savior. Um, Jesus said, hey, you know, it's the sick I have come for. It's those who are needy I've come for. And so, because um, he came as a savior. And, you know, there's two schools of general schools of thought when it comes to church. And, you know, people have been debating this for, you know, centuries probably. But, um, but the local church, one, one thought, one perspective is that the local church is for Christians only. The other school of thought is that the local church is for everyone. Now, in a sense, they're both right. Because theologically, number one, the first one, the first one focuses on a theological technicality. The capital C church is the body of believers. See, that's, that is correct. But what we also know is, is that the church, the local church is the hope of the world. The, the local church puts flesh and bones to what Jesus said when he said, um, he said it to Peter, but there was others there. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What he was talking about is us reaching people. And really the disciples, even at that point, didn't really believe. They didn't believe that Jesus died and was buried, rose again, because they hadn't died and buried and was raised again. I was reading this week um, on uh, some articles and, uh, online about motivation. And most of what I was reading was, was business related, but some of it was kind of like self-help, self-care, you know, kind of things. And I, um, I learned that what some people call motivation is really manipulation. I also realized, and this can happen in a church setting too, I also realized that some people confused worked up with motivated. Uh, those of you who are coffee drinkers, right? A few cups of coffee or that quadruple latte or whatever you, uh, you know, with all the, with, you know, eight shots of whatever, you know, you know um, that might get you, you know, that might get you worked up in a sense and energized, but that's not your motivation. Well, some of you might say, well, a little bit, you know, if you're a real coffee connoisseur, but, and a little coffee, a little caffeine might help you to feel a little bit more motivated, but you, coffee isn't your reason for getting up, right? But since you got to get up, isn't it nice for those of you coffee drinkers, isn't it nice that you're, it's there, right? You know, study shows that everyone seems to be motivated, stirred, reasons for getting up in the morning, different things. Um, what motivates you? Today, let's consider what should motivate us as Christians um, and by the way, this isn't a guilt thing, like how dare you be motivated by this, you should be motivated by that. This is going to make a lot of sense, especially to those of you who are Christ followers. I absolutely love seeing people, I, I love seeing you each week, absolutely love seeing you each, each week. But stay with me on this, can I tell you who my favorite people are on Sunday are? My favorite people to see on Sunday are the people I've never seen before. They get me all excited. Can I tell you, you want to know who really excites me? People who really excite me are people who go, you know, I Pastor David, I really am not, I'm not a church person. I'm not really, I don't even know if I really believe any of what you said, but I thought I'd give it a chance. I thought I'd, you know, check it out. And so here I am. Those people, I mean, those people get my heart going. They really, now some of you are going, well, wait, I've been here for 15, 20 years, whatever. And you, you don't, shouldn't you be more excited about me? I'm very excited to see you, but those of you who know me best know I, I love it to see people that aren't sure what they believe. They, uh, they came in, and that's a hard thing. 
to go into even a new environment, that's a, that's a tough one. And for them to walk into church, maybe they, maybe they were in a different kind of church or maybe they had a bad experience in church. And for them to walk in and say, eh, I'm going to give it a shot um, is, so, is so wonderful. But I think the reason why we, I, I mentioned that is because there's a tendency. I want to share a tendency, a truth really I've, I've learned in this almost 40 years of ministry, and that is this. And that's those of you who are just dying to fill out something on your notes. Finally, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Some of you are nodding. I'm not going to, yeah, I, I, I know. Uh, that's me too. I like filling out stuff. But here's it. There's a gravitational pull. The gravitational pull for every church, and I'm generalizing, of course, is to become a church for church people. Um, it's especially our kind of church people, whatever that may be. And no matter how a church starts, and it's usually with good intentions. They, you know, it's always, sometimes they say, no, we want to reach the unchurched. We want to be a church for the unchurched. Um, it's, it all, but our tendency is to be a church for church people, whatever that might look like. Now, that's not uni unique to us. I'm not giving Hillside a bad time. If I'm giving anybody a hard time, it's the, it's the church in general, local churches in general. Most churches get to a point where they cater to people who already know what's going on. Um, we, you know, we generally cater the people who already know where to park, already know where to take their kids, already know where the bathrooms are, already know what the schedule is and, and so forth and, uh, where their friends are sitting and so forth. And, you know, which seats not to sit in because, you know, there are people who've got their, you know, um, <laughs> people who, people who, um, will evaluate the service. They, they, you know, they walk in and they say, uh, well, that was. That song, we, didn't we sing that song last week? Or uh, didn't we, um, wasn't that music a little bit loud? And, and wasn't that message a little too long? And, and, um, and then people, you know, share their criticisms. And then we're, we're, attempt, we're tempted to change things because people are upset. Because we want to keep people. We don't want to lose anybody. And that's, you know, as a pastor, I want to tell you, um, that's, that's the worst. I, I don't like losing people. But, um, but one of my biggest concerns, and this has grown, thank God, over the years, but has always been that I don't want us ever to lose sight of lost people and become content with making each other happy. Um, now, I don't want you to be miserable, right? Okay, I do want you to be happy. But I know in my years of ministry, I wasted, I can think back of times when I wasted a lot of time trying to make people happy who actually didn't want to be happy. What, what they wanted to be was right, right? And so, you know, I spent way too much of that. But because of that gravitational pull toward insiders, not people who aren't here, you know, I, here, here's, here's why we have a tendency to forget people who aren't here. And you might want to jot this down. People who aren't here, aren't here. Okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, that's some heavy stuff there. I, I, you know, that's deep, <laughs> right? That's a big one. See, the people who don't come here, they never complain about the music. They never complain about the messages or the volume or the length of the service. Or, they don't complain about anything. Um, in fact, sometimes if a person comes for the first time and they don't like something, guess what they do? They just don't come back. And here's why we have that tendency to forget people, because they're not here. So it's natural for us to want to cater to those people. You know, it's, it's make the customers happy. That, that's, I would never call you, I mean, you're family, you're not customers, but you understand what I'm saying. So today, I want to share a passage that I had really been kind of camping on in my own private life um, that I hope will be a direct motivation to all of us to help us resist this natural pull to self-serving. And, and by the way, let me just say, I'm not just talking about a church. I'm talking about why you go to your place of work. Why do you go to school? And you say, well, because my mom makes me. I, beyond that, you know, if I don't get that degree, I'm not going to get this job. Something bigger than that. There's a bigger pull. There's a better motivation to all of that. Now, depending on how you were raised, you may think of the Bible as one big giant book. Uh, now it's just a small little app, right? But, uh, but it's a, you, know, you think of it that way as one book. And, and that's, it's not actually one book. It's much, much more miraculous than that. Um, it's separate documents that God miraculously inspired and brought together. You may have heard, hey, God wrote the Bible. But then sometimes I will say, Paul wrote this book. And you go, wait, 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 wait. Help me out here. Little theological sideline. Jesus was 100% God, right? 
Jesus was also 100% man. So mathematically, help me out here, folks. That seems like mutually exclusive, right? That seems like that's there's no problem with that at all. When God's word was written, God inspired it, but he used people. And why do I make a point of that? God wrote the Bible through people. So technically, people and God wrote the Bible. It's inspired by God. It's God's holy word. It's his message to us. But there's this human factor that is so wonderful, and that's that human part of the, this section of scripture that I want to kind of pull out because it'll help us to see what motivated the person writing this. Um, and it really makes this powerful. Now, the section that, I, uh, that we're going to look at was written by the Apostle Paul. Now, what's great about reading the Apostle Paul is even the most liberal you know, universities, atheistic universities, people believe the Apostle Paul existed. All right, so they, they know he was a historical figure. No one doubts that there was an Apostle Paul. Um, and interestingly, though, Paul steps onto history not as an apostle, and not even as a Christian. He steps on simply as a Jew, but a Jew who hated Christians. And that's the way he enters uh, history. Now, if you're here, I don't know um, that this would be the case, but if you hate Christians... You might like Paul. Um, read, read some of Paul. Now, you probably don't hate Christians as much as Paul did, even if they irritate you. You might say, well, sometimes Christians irritate me. Paul was so hateful of Christians that he persecuted them. He threw them in prison, even had them killed. And so that, that's, that's some pretty deep hate that he had for them. But why? Because he felt like he was doing God a favor. He saw these people teaching this knockoff religion called the way <clears throat> instead of, uh, you know, classic Orthodox Judaism as he saw it, and, um, <clears throat> and they're worshiping someone who supposedly rose from the dead. How crazy is that? And by the way, this isn't many years after the resurrection took place. So there are people running around who actually saw Jesus before and after the resurrection. Uh, they're making these claims about Jesus, and Paul thinks that they're, they're trying to hijack Judaism. And he's going to stamp out this whole movement. But, but in the process of trying to stamp it out, he becomes one. He becomes a Christian. Jesus recruits him in Acts chapter 9. You may remember that from our Acts study. Of course you do, um, uh, vividly. And, uh, but, but he becomes a Christian. And he not only becomes a Christian, but it's almost like he's on a mission to repair all the damage he's done. It's like he was persecuting the Christians. He was throwing them in jail. And now he's doing this just complete flip. And he's thinking, wow, I'm going to make up for it. I'm going to try and get as many people to become Christians as possible. And so when he does that, we, you know, he takes the message of Christianity beyond the borders of Palestine and, to, and in Judea and takes it all over the world. So when he writes what we're going to read, it's so emotional. And that's what I don't want you to miss. It's so emotional because he had come from being extremely anti-Christian to now being a passionate fan, proponent, probably what we would consider beside Jesus, the greatest missionary of all times. And look at the passion with which he writes 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting at verse 14. He says this, for Christ's love compels us. And that's why I changed my title and my message there. Christ loves compels, not God's judgment. Think about not God's judgment, not fear of hell, not the wrath of God. It's Christ's love. Now, the way it's written in Greek, it could be either Christ's love for us or our love for Christ. In Paul's perspective, Christ's love for him or his love for Christ. I don't think that we have to make a distinction on which one it is. I think it's a combination of both. Christ's love for me, and as a result, my love for Christ is what compels me. See, Paul was telling the people, that's what should stir us. That's what should motivate us to spread the message of the gospel. Now, I want to just say my personal testimony. One of the things I don't, I think I accepted Christ more because I was afraid of dying than because, I, because of Christ's love. It was only after becoming a Christian I realized, oh my goodness, this is so much bigger than just, you know, oh, I'm afraid to go to hell. It's Christ loves us. He's given everything for us. And when Christ, when we look at that word, uh, the, that word compels, when you look at that word, you know, really deeply, it means a number of things. I just wanted to put these up here for you very quickly, just to kind of see this. When it says that Christ's love compels, it, what it means is it guides us. Christ's love compels us. It guides us. That's the first little blank there, um, under there. The second is that it guards us. 
You look at that word that we translate compels, it means he guards us. It, it keeps us between the guardrails, we could say, his love. It also unifies us. Jesus said, they'll know you're Christians by your love for each other. It's not, that's what we rally around as, as Christ followers, as believers, as Christians. Every Christian were, uh, rallies around not, um, not baptism style or communion style or style of music or formalities or rituals, all that. What unites us as believers throughout the whole world is simply what he said, is Christ's love for us and our love for Christ. That's what motivates us. But you know, it also, it focuses us. It focuses, I hope it's Christ's love that helps us focus our attention and resources, even as, an acti as, as a church, but also on our daily lives. That that's what motivates us to keep going. Christ's love helps us focus. It's also Christ's love that motivates, it drives us. That's what should get us up in the morning. That's what should drive us. It compels us to, to do whatever we do. It's, the scripture says to do everything to the glory of God. Um, so it motivates us. And that's, that's why I came to Hillside, you know, 33 years ago. And I pray that we never lose sight of that. Think about it. When Christ came into the world, it was good news. That was the declaration on that first, you know, Christmas when Jesus came. I bring you good news, great joy. Everybody, everybody likes good news. And my opinion is that anyone who rejects Christianity, and again, this may be a little idealistic, but I feel like anyone who rejects Christianity just doesn't understand that it's good news. They don't understand the good news. I, I've never met anyone who resisted good news. And whatever people reject about Christianity isn't the good news part, I think. It might be somebody's twist of Christianity or their caricature of Christianity, their stereotype of Christianity, their additions that, you know, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they were classic with that, adding a bunch of stuff to what scripture said. Because Christianity at its core is good news. Paul, who wrote this, used to think it was very bad news. He thought it was anti-God. He thought it was anti-Judaism. He thought it was anti a lot of things. And then he realized that the greatest news is that God sent his son, that he loves us, and that he sent his son into the world for us. And before us asking God anything from you, he wants you to know that he did something for you. When we come to God, especially if uh, we're not believers, uh, we might say, you know, oh yeah, God wants me to do this. And he wants me to stop that. And he wants my money and he wants my, before God ever asks anything from us, he wants us to know, I've done something for you. I've given everything for you. That's good news. See, that's good news. There's a lot we could say about God, but it's Christ's love that compels us. Um, people have come and gone over the years. <clears throat> some, have, some have liked it, and I'm talking about churches in general. You know, some people have come here, liked it. Some people, you know, haven't. But the truth is, I want every single person who walks into this building and walks out of this building, whether it's once or a thousand times, I want every person to know that and, and, and realize in their heart that God loves them and that that love was demonstrated. Whether they wanted it to be demonstrated to them or not, God demonstrated his love for them by Christ dying on their behalf. So, so Paul, Paul explains that. He says this, and then he goes on. He says, you know, Christ's love, it compels us because we are convinced, you know, it took some convincing for Paul. He wasn't, he wasn't neutral on this. He was, he was anti-Christian. So because we are convinced that one died for all, talking about Jesus, and therefore all died, which basically means we're all good as dead. But then Christ died instead. He died for us. And so, uh, you know, so we don't have to die. We, we're all separated from God and deserve eternal separation from God. But Christ took our payment. He took our death. Doesn't mean we won't die physically, but that eternal death, that eternal separation from God. So it was like we died with Christ, but we, we, didn't, we didn't die for our own sin. We died because we we're placed in Christ. We're part of him. We identified with that. He died on our behalf. And verse 15 says, and he died for all. That those who live, those who, it's not just talking about those who physically live. It's talking about those who put their faith in Christ. That those who live should no longer live for themselves. But for him who died for them and was raised again. He says, those of us 
who understand that this is good news and that God's done something for us, we can't keep this to ourselves. We can no longer live for ourselves. We can't just say, hey, God, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, and then load up on what he's done and then just, you know, go on our merry way. God says, that's not my plan at all. He says, you know, yes, we thank God. We're grateful for what he's done. He, he says, when it dawns on a person, what Christ has done for us, when it really hits us, what he's done for us, those people can no longer keep it to themselves. The response of the true Christian is, Lord, because of what you've done for me, because of the love you've shown, how dare I keep this to myself? I, I could never do that. I'm so grateful for what you've done in my life. I'm, I'm offering my life to you, not because I'm afraid of what you'll, you'll do if I don't, or afraid that you won't bless me or whatever. It's not out of guilt. I offer my life to you because of what you have done for me, that love you've shown me. Your love for me compels me. Paul expands on that, and then he, and he explains in, in verse 18. It says, all this that he just explained is from God. Then he introduces this wonderful word, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, as most of you know, to, you know, to reconcile means to, to take two things that aren't compatible and bring them together and make them compatible. It's taking two things that aren't in agreement and making them in, uh, in agreement. Some of you have, say, I have to reconcile my relationship with my you know, family member or friend or whatever. You understand that. You're at odds. You're at, against each other and you bring that together. And Paul says that on, the, on our own, we're not able to reconcile ourselves to God. There's nothing we can do. We can't be good enough, clean ourselves up enough, you know, be wonderful and awesome enough. We had this irreconcilable difference. I was a sinner. God is perfect and holy. That's irreconcilable, right? And even though all of our lives it, were irreconcilable, God wanted to reconcile with you. That wasn't your idea. You're not banging on the door going, God, will you let me in? God came seeking us. That's why he sent Jesus, seeking us, seeking to, say, to, seek and to save those who are lost. And he knew we couldn't reconcile ourselves to him. See, if we tried our whole life to reconcile, it's not going to happen. And there's a, there's a couple of reasons. One, because we didn't even know how. And secondly, we can never be good enough. How good is good enough? Perfectly, sinlessly, flawless, and holy. <laughs> so even if you could be perfect from this point on, think about it. If you could be perfect from this point on, you'd only be meeting God's standard from this point on. What do you do with the rest of it? What do you do with the beginning of your life, you know? For most of you, as I look to you, if you're all about, what, 20s, 30s, something like that. Um, what do you do with that first 20 years, all right? What do you do, what do, you do with that? And that's what he's saying. Um, those imperfections, that sin. But that the good news is, God made the first move. Ministry, that isn't a good translation of this word. Not a bad word, it's just not the good translation of that. See, it, the, the word in Greek isn't a religious word. And ministry, we think of very, very, being very religious. Uh, when we hear ministry, you know what you think of? Think of what I do. It's like, well, ministry, that's what Pastor David does. Okay, so yes, I, and I say something, I'm in the ministry. But actually, if you were to pick a career, it was really more consistent with like a waiter or a server. The word here, it just means task. That's what it simply means. He says, God has reconciled us, and now he's given us the task or the responsibility of reconciliation. In other words, God has done something for you and me, and now God wants us to partner with him and help other people in the world to understand. To understand, hey, God has something for you because he's done something for you. And God did everything you need to be reconciled to God. So how did God do that? How could God reconcile a relationship that was irreconcilable? Again, it sure wasn't because I was good enough. Verse 19 says, that, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Now, okay, that sounds all churchy and everything, but how are you going to do that? What does that look like? He said, not counting people's sins against them. Oh, okay. Our sin is what makes us irreconcilable to God. But God loves us and God is perfect. God is holy and God is the God of the universe. And he wants us to know him and to know his presence so he knew he'd have to do something about our biggest problem, which is sin. 
So God says, okay, because of what Christ did for you, I'm not going to count these sins against you anymore. I'm going to remove that barrier of sin and allow you to be reconciled to God. How could that be bad news? How could that be anything but good news? The very stuff we hold over our own head, God doesn't hold against us. The sin of our life, God doesn't hold that against us. That is really good. I mean, how, you kind of think, how could you resist that? See, the issue is, are we willing to try and do something about our own sin, even though it's not going to accomplish, I was going to say much, anything, really? Or are you willing to accept the fact that God has done something about your sin for you? The Apostle Paul one time called himself the chief among sinners. And most of us know ourselves well enough. Some of us would say, eh, I'd like to, like to talk to him about that. I may have taken his spot by, you know, at this point. He thought himself as the worst of the worst. Why? Because not only did he reject Christ, but he also tried to destroy Christianity. I mean, he persecuted Christians. And so he thought, I, I am the worst. It doesn't get any worse than that. I mean, it's one thing to reject God, but then to try, you know, beat up on people and even have them jailed and even killed for believing in Christ. But Paul knew that God was no longer counting his sins against him. That's why we can hear so much joy in his life, even in the hard times. So here's something that might be helpful. If God is not counting your sins against you, that means you are now free to no longer count your sins against you. I've had times when my wife has said, you know what? You're harder on yourself than God is. You know what that is? That's arrogance. When I'm harder on myself, God says, I don't count that anymore, but I'm going to beat myself up over it. See, that's, I mean, unless you have a higher standard than God, it means you are, you are also free, and this is maybe where it gets a little tricky and a little harder, but it also means you're free to count other people, not to not count other people's sins against them. Isn't that, but you don't understand what they did. I don't, I, I'll, I've, I've heard somebody this week say, I'll never forgive them. And I thought, ooh, that's a bitter barrier. Of, that's a weight you just don't want to carry. I mean, yeah, hold people's sins against them if, if your standards are higher than God's, I guess. But see, when we, forgive, when we receive the forgiveness of God, it empowers us to forgive ourselves and to forgive others. In being reconciled to God, we can find ourselves reconciled then to other people. Um, and it goes on, it says, and he has committed to us the message. That's, that's the, the word for word, logos, um, the, the ministry of reconciliation, the message of reconciliation. Just like you've been reconciled now, you get to help other people understand that how they can be reconciled as well. That's what he's saying. Verse 20 says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. I love this, um, and I don't want to get all Greeky and geeky on you, but, but this making appeal is cool because it's, it's, it's a single Greek word that was a term um, that they used in a court of law. It's like God's our lawyer, and he's making his closing arguments, and he's pleading our case, and he wants everybody to understand the message and to embrace it. We are the instruments through which God um, is making his appeal to the world. Let me say it more personally. We're the instruments God is making that he wants to make his appeal through your world, through my world. See, there's some parts of our worlds that overlap, and I'm talking about the people we know and the areas we... But there's some... That's, that's you. You're the instrument God wants to use in that. And listen now. He closes this. He says, we implore you. This is our message as Christians. This is our message. This is our message as a church. Okay, both capital C church as well as small T hillside local body church. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. See, the point is that if, if people reject Christianity, let's make sure it's not because they think that Christianity means you have to perform some kind of feat, some kind of, you know, you get clean up your life, start living like a Christian, and then you can become one. So it's just totally backwards. See, the Holy Spirit comes into our life after we accept Christ. The Holy Spirit comes in and starts to make us more like Christ. But we, it's just a societal thing. It's a cultural thing. Eh, clean up your life and then maybe you can come to church with us. No, make sure they're not rejecting the good news. 
that they can be reconciled. The only thing keeping anyone from really being reconciled to God is not God. It's a person's willingness to accept the fact that they, he's no longer holding and counting their sins against them. If they receive that forgiveness, they receive his salvation, receive him as Savior, they're clean. They're perfect before God. Through Christ, the way has always been cleared. So here's kind of a summary statement that I want you to, to kind of take away. And that is this. The love of Christ compels us to urge people to be reconciled to God. That's it. The love of Christ, both his for us, ours for him, urge us, that urge people to be reconciled to God. That's it. That's why we do what we do. That's why, you know, I've had people say, well, why don't you just stop doing this area ministry? Why, why don't you just stop? I, I'm so committed and it's just obsessive. I understand that. I, I want so many, I, I want people to know they are loved and they can be reconciled to God. That's it. Because as soon as I tell people I'm a pastor, they think, oh, okay, they want me to come to my church or they want me to give money or they want me to volunteer for something. It's like, no, no, no. I want them to know, first of all, God's done something for you. He just wants something from you. He wants something for you. And then you'll see that you'll want to respond and say, yes, I want what God has for me. That's it. We're in a weird stage right now. Are, are we back to normal? <laughs> you know, I don't think we're going to know normal. I, I mean, th this is a new normal, right? As the author said, you know, normal is a setting on your dryer. You know, <laughs> I mean, th there's, that's it. That's about all there is. Uh, and, and so we're in a transition period where, where the church of Christ needs to, you know, the body of Christ needs to take this seriously and say, we're in a transition period where we've got to reach people and let them know. That was a really easy window for those who, you know, were in the habit of coming to church or going to church or, you know, were seeking out, you know, Christ and his, you know, following him. That was an easy window for, to just kind of ditch everything. And after a couple of years, you know, you can convince yourself almost of anything that you don't need to have something around. And so um, here's, what, here's what we want to do. I want, I just, this is kind of a reminder. It was a good, it was good for me. And this isn't anything perhaps that you haven't heard me say before, but maybe this organized, semi-organized helps us to really focus. But the first thing I hear, I want us to see is this. We, what we, we got to remember. Number one, here's what we must remember. We've got to remember that we are a church designed to reconcile people to God. Now you said, you just said that. I want us to know that for us, right here at 108 Hillside Road, that our purpose is to help people be reconciled to God. See, see, I want us to see, I don't just take that personally, I do take that very personally. So wherever I go, whether it has to do with Hillside or not, um, I believe that in helping people get reconciled to God. I want to share that good news. But I also believe it as corporately, as a group, together. So that's why as a church we want to do everything we can to communicate the gospel and tell the good news. You say, why are you getting so worked up right now? I mean, we are in a window of opportunity. And granted, it used to be a lot easier to invite people to Easter because it was almost assumed that people were going to go somewhere for Easter and Christmas. That assumption in our culture has drifted away. So the number of people who are currently attending church and are anticipating to attend church on Easter has dropped. But that doesn't mean you're not still their friend and their family member. That doesn't mean that you don't work with them, that you can't share with them. But we are coming up to a time when it's going to be relatively easier to invite people to church. Hey, where are you going to church this Easter? Well, I really hadn't thought about going to church at all. We were going to do a little egg hunt down at the park. Hey, why don't you go to church with me and celebrate Easter? We're coming in this window. And so, you know, it's April, April 9th. Um, you could practice invite people for next you know, week and week after that too. But I mean, I'm just saying. Um, that's right. Too, too often churches don't feel safe. And, and I think that's one of the things that I have loved about all of you, you have made Hillside a safe place to come. No matter what the church's background is, no matter what people are struggling with, whatever it is, you've made it a safe place and we're, gonna, we're committed to making it a safe place. But a lot of times people have a church history or they have a feeling that, hey, church is not a safe place to go. Because you could be harmed, you could be insulted, you could be ostracized, you could be just ignored. There's a lot of things that can happen in a church setting that I, is not about us. We want people to know this is a safe place. 
Um, you know, we don't, they don't, they're not going to come here and experience rejection and judgment. But, and that's not what Jesus intended anyway. He established his church. He meant for the church to be the magnet for the unchurched. He was, you know. In fact, you know what I love is when you look at the life of Jesus, people who were nothing like Jesus liked Jesus. And Jesus liked people who were nothing like him. And I love that. And I want, that's the way I want to live my life. People don't like, they don't have to like me. But I want them to like me, even if we're not alike. Listen, we, we're the body of Christ. And that's what's important. And if, we, if we're the hands and the feet of Jesus, then we need to look a lot more like him in that. We should, we should like people who are nothing like Jesus. You hear what I said? Because I like people who are like Jesus. They're really, I mean, you talk about being comfortable, but we should like people who are nothing like Jesus and maybe who don't even like Jesus. And people who are nothing like Jesus should like us. Um, I'm just following that pattern of his. I, I want us to be a loving, caring people. I'm not saying don't tell people the truth. Jesus told the truth. He called it the way it was. I, I, I want kids to love coming to church so much that they bug their parents to come. I, I, over the years, that's happened. It's like, well, we weren't going to come, but, you know, the kids, they were saying, come on, we want to go. Um, I uh, love that. You know, <laughs> I think it's great. The second thing I want us to see is that if you know Christ and you have been reconciled with God, reconciled people, reconcile people. Paul said, those who live should no longer live for themselves. Do you know one of my biggest problems in life? You say, Pastor, it's like therapy for you every week, isn't it? One of my biggest problems for life is I live for myself. I want my life to be my life. That's not what God's called us to do. And I don't really get any joy in that, frankly. The real joy comes when I walk away from a situation and think, I just set myself aside and let God work through me. That's when the joy comes. Those who live should no longer live for themselves, he says. Once, once you got it, you've, you've got to pass that along to others. Now, I know people, follow me on this. I know people who, in a sense, they follow Jesus who don't really believe in him uh, yet. And you know why? They've kind of discovered a truth. Because you've had people say this perhaps to you. They say, well, Jesus was taught that you should love everybody and you shouldn't do this. And, you, and sometimes they're right. Sometimes they actually know stuff that Jesus was about. But what they realize is they discover that following Jesus will make your life better and it'll make you better at life. I'm not saying that just, you know, hey, trying to be philosophically like him makes you a Christian, makes you, you know, but they've discovered that. Most of the people, think about it, most of the people who followed Jesus in the first century didn't believe. When Jesus died on the cross, no one really believed. Everyone abandoned him. There was one soldier that said, surely this is, was the son of God. Um, but hopefully along the way, as people watch you, listen to you, as you share things with them, as you connect with them, as they are following maybe what Jesus taught, that they will, that they will want to be in his family, that they will realize he is the son of God, the risen son of God, and that he, will, he wants to be their savior. He, can, he died for their sins, and he can separate them from their sin. He can reconcile to God and then not count those sins against them any longer. Number three, how do we do that? Okay, now I'm just talking about church stuff um, and, and, and actually out in our lives. But how do we do that? We do that by, by serving. We do that by investing. We do that by inviting. What do I mean by that? I, I mentioned, was it last week, a couple weeks ago, about how important, oh, um, uh, no, Andy Stanley mentioned it, about volunteering. How important it is for each of us to volunteer and with something that you like, with something that you're gifted to do, something you're interested in. I'm not saying, you know, if, if it, you know it's volunteering for God when it hurts and you hate it, okay? <laughs> Don't be afraid of what God's going to ask you to do. It's usually something that you're good at or that he's gifted you for or the Holy Spirit wants to teach you. It's usually something very, very good. I'm not saying it's not easy. It might be hard, but um, what, where could you serve him? investing many of you give i mean the reason why the church is still standing and it's been this church has been in existence longer than i have i know it's like an antique um but uh, so uh, the year before i was born this church started and and people have invested in it and given to it and they also also invited now 
can I, can I just be really upfront and honest with you? Somebody, no. Um, I'm going to be anyway, okay. Um, Hillside could be much better at inviting people to church. Um, I think we could be better at that. Now, if you don't have anyone to invite, easy assignment. Go make some friends. <laughs> no, try to connect with people. I understand there's people, people, and there's people you say, Ugh, you know, make some friends. I'm not saying, hey, what's your name? Oh, do you know if you don't accept Jesus that, you know, I'm not saying become their friend, br uh, have a bridge. You know, what did Jesus do? He'd go eat at people's houses. Invite people over, go to lunch with them, just, just connect. And that would be your assignment, to be able then to invite people. Some of you do have people that you would invite and you say, you know what, I, I do know of people that I should invite to come. Now, I'm going to be really honest with you as well. If you say, you know, I would invite people, but you know, we're so small, it's kind of embarrassing, or I don't really have confidence in the leadership, or you preach too long, or you do that. What? Okay, so I, I, all of those, I've heard them all. Um, so I won't even give you the exhaustive list. Look. And I say this with sincerity, just find a church where you can invite people to come to. Seriously, find a Bible believing teaching church where you can invite your friends, where you feel comfortable. Okay. Um, so I, and I, I say that because it's so important. Jesus said, come to the little children, come to us, come, come unto me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Boy, talk about a verse that describes our society today. Then understand that by God's grace, and as long as you're willing to serve and invest in God's work here, hopefully, I'm praying, God's love, Christ's love will be what compels us. You know, at this point in our ministry, you know, uh, just because we're kind of trying to get momentum going again. You know, I would love for people to walk in and say, you know what, they don't have every single ministry going. And, um, but man, those people sure love. Boy, I felt loved. They really love God. I could just tell by the way they worship. I could tell by the way they treated me and my family. I could just tell. They're, they really love. I'd be the happiest guy in the world. Because that's what compels us. Christ's love for us, our love for Christ. Now, before I close this, I have to say, some of you might say, well, you know, I don't really have that kind of confidence you seem to have. That, you know, you're forgiven. That your sins are all gone. Um, that's why God brought you here, if you don't know that for certain. Okay. God wants you to know absolutely that you are a child of God, that your sins are forgiven, that you have eternal life, hope in him, that when this life is over, absent from your body, present with the Lord. That's what God wants you to know. And if you've never made that decision, um, it's a decision of your heart. It's a decision of faith. It's a step you take um, in just trusting him. You were trusting yourself. Now you're trusting him. One of the things that helped me when I accepted Christ was praying and asking Christ to come into my life. Uh, you, could, you don't have to say that out loud. You could say it in your heart. You could do it, but it's a decision of faith. You're crossing that line of faith saying, God, I'm no longer going my own way. I'm going your way. And today, if you would like to do that, I'm going to lead you in a prayer that, um, where you can just reach out to him and say, God, I need your forgiveness. Um, there's nothing magical about this prayer. It's not, you know, it's, it's just, it's a prayer I've written. It's a prayer somewhat similar to what I prayed when I accepted Christ. But if it helps you to make that step and to just encourage yourself, encourage your heart, I want to invite you to pray along with me. Let's, let's bow, shall we? Again, you could say your own prayer expressing that, that you need Christ, but you could pray something like this. Just say, dear God, I come to you today realizing I need to be reconciled to you because I am a sinner. I ask you to forgive all my sin and come into my life. I accept you today. I believe that because you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross, be buried and rise again to save me. You no longer hold my sins against me. Thank you for eternal life and for making me your child. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Lord, we pray above all that your love would compel us to live our daily lives for you. I pray that you would be with each person who just prayed that prayer to accept you as Savior, that your love would just overwhelm them, that they would feel such an overflow of your love and your grace and your peace that um, they wouldn't be able to contain it, that they'd have to share it with someone. And Father, that's my prayer for each of us here, that we would love you, understanding that you loved us so perfectly and wonderfully, and we could never match that kind of love. We could never even understand that kind of love, but may that overflow into our, from our lives as well to, to others around us. We thank you for what you're going to do in us and through us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much again for joining me today. And if there's any way I can be of help or encouragement to you, please feel free to reach out to me. You can email me. My email address is right there. Um, you can Facebook message me if that's the way you saw the message today. Uh, I also, if you could contact me and you'd like to talk on the phone, I'd be glad to send you my phone number. You might have some questions about something I said today or uh, questions about spirituality or about the Bible. Maybe you just have something you'd like me to pray for. I'd be glad to do that. So just feel free to reach out to me and I'll be so happy to help in any way I can. Hey, thanks again for joining me and I look forward to connecting with you again next week. Take care and God bless.